someone somewhere, and I and, and this is important because I don't want to talk about how good or bad I was at my job, but I realized that someone somewhere, you know, senior, someone more powerful, someone with a lot more um, power to make a change in my life, uh, no, noticed me. How did, what does fitness mean to you? And how did you go from being somebody who in his own words was unhealthy and uncomfortable yeah. with, uh, yeah. with the way he was yeah. to, you know, your uh, perception today? And how I survived and how things turned around over the next nine or 10 months. And we, we broke even nine months later, turned the airline around. We didn't have to look back, fortunately. That, I think the credit goes to the leadership team of Indigo that I was surrounded by. I am thrilled to welcome Aditya Ghosh today to Network Capital. Our mission is to help every person, every organization on their planet build their category of one. And Aditya is definitely someone who has built his category of one in a wide range of industries, be it aviation, hospitality. And most recently, I had the best meal that I've ever had in London uh, at, uh, you know, at Chorangi, a place that he's curated and designed. And, uh, you know, um, it was just like a phenomenal uh, experience. And then when I started digging in, I stumbled into the fact that, oh, this is Aditya's adventure. And uh, that's why I said, you know, we really want to discuss the career principles of this gentleman. So here we are. Thanks so much for your time, Aditya. My pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. So, um, you know, let's just get started by uh, your Sanskrit exam back in school. So you failed the Sanskrit exam, right? Uh, how, how did you how, even know that? <laughs> normally, yes. Uh, normally when we see, see CEOs and leaders, we think that they have impeccable academic and professional records. No, they perhaps certainly have... Certainly not uh, me. You know, <laughs> certainly not me. <laughs> Um, so tell us about that Sanskrit exam and what did that teach you about, uh, you know, about the education system and leadership in general? Oh, well, this was in grade five. Uh, and, uh, and this was, um, you know, uh, I, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm ethnically a Bengali. My Hindi is reasonably good now, uh, actually quite good. But uh, in those days, I definitely struggled with it. And, and Sanskrit was was even more difficult. And this was the second term exam where I just kind of absolutely failed miserably. And I think that was the first exam that I, that I failed, the test that I failed. Uh, so it was very embarrassing and very um, challenging as a 10 year old or nine year old that I was at that time. And, um, and then I kind of said you know, to myself that you know, I'm going to try to, to um, to a, do a better job of it and I'm going to just kind of focus on it. And, uh, and then I did. And uh, in the next, the final term, I got uh, whatever, uh, 25 out of 25, I think those, those are the marks. So it was a dramatic U-turn for me, uh, for, you know, thankfully for the positive. But uh, not that I've maintained it or I've followed it 100% of the time, but what it you know, definitely taught me early on as a 10 year old is that, you know, things that you are scared of, challenges that you kind of, you know, run away from, um, if you actually just put your heart and soul into it and you actually focus on it and kind of almost take the bull by the horn, um, you know, there is, uh, there is every chance that you're going to be able to kind of, you know, beat that fear. And, and I, I don't know whether come out victorious or not, but certainly come out less afraid. Yeah. And I think you, in your writings, in your talks, you've talked about uh, two things that really struck a chord with me. And interestingly, Arunabha, uh, your brother, who we've also hosted on Network Capital, he no, also no, mentioned the much time. brighter, the much brighter sibling, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, one was on the power of compounding. And the yeah. other was on the power of looking inward rather than looking towards the competition to, work, to guiding you. So could you tell us about how these two have been important pillars of your leadership, both of your uh, time um, as a student and as a CEO of companies? Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's something that I kind of came to realize more when I was, uh, 
when in my early stages of my career and more importantly when i was as the chief executive or, or leading a large business um, and this is something i it's, it's a thought that i often share with a lot of my colleagues you know the thing is that when when we make mistakes uh, when uh, when uh, things don't turn out to be the way we expect them to be fail an exam you know something of that sort um, or or miss a target uh, what the instinct is to always look around and beat yourself up and really really struggle with what other people will say about you you know and how others will will judge you and uh, i i've come to realize that uh, that you know that's a complete waste of time because it doesn't help at all it doesn't help one way or the other you know it doesn't help if if you are focusing on people who are saying you know you did not work hard enough you did not you know you, you don't deserve it and you were anyway bound to fail and you did this wrong and you did that wrong and how could you and so on and so forth and it's also equally bad when somebody turns around and say hey, don't worry about it it's all right you know there's always a second chance life is and neither of this those things help you what actually helps you is to look within and say you know what what could i have done differently you know how could i have been better prepared for for something like this you know if i had to turn the clock back what what are the things that i would have done differently and that then allows you to to kind of you know approach this whole thing in a very different way and the next time around you come out better prepared and so on and so forth you know i i i've you know i've i've heard this saying that failure is my friend and and so on and so forth failure is never my friend i uh, but but i've said that i've also realized that it's a constant companion and uh, and 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 therefore from those failures from those mistakes um you realize that you know this is what i should have done differently and and you come back and 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 approach it in a in a better manner you know the next time around yeah and you've taken these two principles throughout your career right which has been really adventurous from law uh, yeah. no business degree to actually uh, you know becoming ceo of multiple companies and i think that uh, based on my analysis of uh, you know how you approach these industries the power of compounding is something that jumps out over and over again and i once heard you uh, i we didn't know each other at that time telling the story of uh, of 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 rice in a chessboard of how this person went uh, and then uh, instead of asking the king for half of his uh, real estate he said that i just want equivalent to a grain of rice and i thought that you know this person really believes and internalizes the power of compounding um so has your career been a uh, compounding step by step has there been a clear plan towards your career or it is a bit of serendipity and a bit of planning i i think i think a lot of serendipity in 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 some ways you know um the the yeah actually that rice story frankly i mean i i i heard about it from uh Uh, a colleague of mine uh, anita who used to work for me uh, with me um, at indigo and then at oyo um, she's the one who told me about this rice story actually and how, maybe you can tell it all our listeners may not know of it yeah uh, actually it's about this uh, if i remember it correctly she says it but she tells it better if, if i remember correctly it's like the king asks him um, you know how what do you want and and uh, you know you can have whatever you you want and you know people are expecting him to uh, to ask for for land or jewelry or wealth or whatever it is and this person says you know all I, all i want is that i want a a grain of rice uh, to to begin with on a chess board and then for every square just you know just double that, that grain of rice and then of course when you when you you know do the math of it you you have you have uh, you know enough to feed you for many 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 years and the 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 probably the the takeaway from that is that irrespective of of what you are doing at that point in time right um 
whatever be the work that you're doing, um, you may not know how it's going to finally translate to that big dream of yours that you might have. But every step along the way, you know, it helps you to, to get to whatever you want to get to. Provided, again, you put a heart and soul into whatever is the job that you're doing. In, in my case, you know, I started off my career um, in a law firm called J. Sagar Associates, and I was, uh, I was 21 years old at that time. Uh, and um, as an intern, and I heard the rice story much later and it made sense to me because whether it was as an intern, like, I don't know, photocopying papers and, and putting files together and getting prepared for meetings and making notes and, and, and things like that, um, or for that matter, you know, as, as the career progressed, um, whatever I, I did, someone somewhere, and, I, and, and this is important because I don't want to talk about how good or bad I was at my job. But I realized that someone somewhere, you know, senior, someone more powerful, someone with a lot more um, power to make a change in my life, uh, no, noticed me and, and, and said, you know what, I'm going to give this guy an opportunity. And from there on, you know, came the next opportunity and the next opportunity and so on and so forth, right? So whether it was uh, Mr. Sagar at, at, the, at the firm, or whether it was, um, you know, Rahul Bhatia, who was my first, uh, uh, you know, uh, shareholder, founder at, at Indigo, or Rakesh, who was the, you know, uh, uh, co-founder of Indigo, or whether it is Ritesh or William, or, you know, today, uh, Vinay and, and Rakesh uh, Junjunwala, who are, Vinay Dubey and Rakesh Junjunwala, who are my partners at Akasa, the new airline. Um, Somewhere, someone along the way said that, you know what, there is something in this guy uh, and let's, let's give him a chance or let's give him a, that, that opportunity. Um, I think, and, and, and I think that's, that's important because, you know, a lot of times I, I, I work a lot with youngsters, as, as, as you know, you know, whether it was at the airline or in the restaurant business, hotels business, retail, uh, the social impact work that I do at Seva, I can sense that at times, you know, people get impatient, right? Uh, and people think that, how is this helping my career? And I want to be at a certain place and I want to drive this car and I want to have this home and, and I want to have this wealth or I want to, you know, be a billionaire or wh whatever it might be. We lose track of the, the steps of, of, uh, in the ladder. We, we lose track of, of those squares in the, in the, in the chessboard. Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, very important not to lose track of. Yeah. Um, if you were to venture a guess, these wide range of people from William to Ritesh to um, Mr. Junjanwala, uh, what have they seen in you? Um, are you a deep generalist? Are you somebody who, you know, who's able to get results? Um, I have a theory, but I'm very interested in yours. So the, my most candid, honest answer, right, uh, Karsh, is that uh, I've never had the courage to go and ask them that because it might, it might make them rethink their decision. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, uh, if I can hazard a guess, <laughs> and really this is hazarding a guess, and I'm not trying to sound cool about it, uh, I think if I hazard a guess, it would be that... Uh, um, I, I do try, try to take a lot of interest in whatever is the, you know, role and responsibility that has, that has been given to me, right? I, I live in the constant fear that, you know, I should not be, I should not, um, you know, be seen as irresponsible or I should not be seen as somebody who did not put in their heart and soul into, into it. Not that I don't get lazy, not that I don't slip up, not that I, I, I don't procrastinate. But, but it is that sort of fear that is there in your gut, you know, um, that kind of helps you and keeps you motivated. Uh, since you talked about my grade five, I'll tell you something very interesting. Uh, I don't think I've said this uh, anywhere in public before. Grade one, right, class one. I remember um, my class teacher, Mrs. Davis, I was in 1B. And in, in my report card as a six-year-old, she had written, Aditya has a great sense of responsibility. 
I, I had I had no idea what that word meant. And I the reason I remember the story is I remember in the parent teacher meeting, me asking my parents, what does that what does that mean? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> and, uh, and and this is funny. It's it, I, I was six years old at that time. I think this responsibility has guided you um, and taken you in a wide range of industry. Um, you know, in my book, I write about the concept of luck surface area. And luck surface area to me means doing great things and telling lots of people or for figuring out a way to scale, uh, you know, your uh, insight and knowledge. How did that happen for you? How did you become quote unquote lucky? And what does luck mean to you, if anything? Uh, look, um, I, I think, I think you know, everyone, everyone is lucky. I, I, I truly believe that. Um, and I say this because, with a lot of confidence because I grew up as a teenager thinking, you know, I'm really unlucky, you know. Uh, I am, I am fat and I'm, and I'm dark-skinned and, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, there are friends who have, who have a car and 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 all the things that you know the the teenage you know agony that you have and um, and uh, I don't have any girlfriends you know all of all of the things but over a period of time I've realized that you know everyone is lucky what does what that means is that life presents opportunities to to everyone you know uh, it's a question of whether we have the willingness. Uh, whether we have the energy, whether we have the enthusiasm, the patience um, to, to try to kind of, you know, make the most out of that opportunity. Um, and I think where I figured that I am getting lucky is when I, I by chance, took a few opportunities very seriously. And because of the focus, like in the Sanskrit exam, something turned out to be a success, I figured, hey, you know what? It's now kind of working in my favor. But when I look back, it was only because I was focusing on it more than, than I focused on it before. Um, I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a, an example of this. This is in the fall of 1997, uh, two or three months into my internship at the firm, right? And... Um, and, and what happened was that, uh, you know, after the first three months, I started getting complacent, okay? And uh, I stand, started spending more time on phone calls and, and, you know, and slipping on deadlines or kind of, you know, taking life a little bit more, uh, more easy than, than, you know, than I was in, at the beginning of the internship. And I remember that my, my then boss, uh, Mr. Rajinder Kumar, we used to call him RK. RK kind of pulled me aside and one day and sat me down and said, he said, what, what, what are you doing? Uh, and I first didn't understand. And he says, you know, you've got this great opportunity and what are you doing? Like, why are you suddenly distracted and things like that? RK was a very quiet sort of a person. And, uh, and uh, and he never raised his uh, decibel level ever. But that, those few sentences kind of made me realize, hey, whoa, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's, you know, hold on to the reins again. Come on, let's, let's get serious. Um, and, um, and I think it's, it's these times when I have focused on it, I've realized that I'm getting lazy. I realize I'm getting distracted. I realize that I'm not focusing enough on it. And I corrected myself. That's when that's when things started working in my favor, or I started getting lucky, right? And then the the times I failed, or the times that I've the outcome has not been what I thought it would be. When I look back, I think that maybe I did not put in enough effort behind. The right. point that you're making, Utkarsh, is also important. That then when you take that, and then you spread that, and you help people realize that they have similar luck, similar opportunity and, and uh, to, to make the most of it. And you, and you see a, a sea change in, in other people, you see a sea change in, in an organization. Um, I think uh, that, that 
it, it's a great feeling. It's it's a cocaine rush, you know. Uh, I don't <laughs> know that I've cocaine, but <laughs> I'm assuming that's what that's what like you know really sort of uh, you know gives you the impetus, gives you the enthusiasm to to keep going more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you briefly touched upon fitness. I think you're considered uh, perhaps the fittest CEO uh, in the country or the region. So that also uh, demonstrates a very serious commitment or curiosity. Uh, can you tell us briefly before we uh, march into the other section of this uh, masterclass, how did, what does fitness mean to you? And how did you go from being somebody who in his own words was unhealthy and uncomfortable yeah, with, uh, yeah. with the way he was yeah. to you know, your uh, perception today? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking me that question because it's, uh, it's important. Um, Look, uh, especially growing up in India, uh, at least the time that I was, uh, you know, there's a, there's a perception that, you know, kids who are, who are fat are supposed to be fat and there is some genetically, there is something wrong with it. And kids who are supposed to be fit are, are just happen to be fit and they'll always be fit. And there is very little combination of both, you know, uh, uh, there are a few kids, of course, who 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 challenge that and, and have done it successfully. My brother's wife, Meghna, you should speak to her sometime. She's one of those. She's a Rhodes Scholar, Harvard MBA, also an ex-Asian Games swimmer. But but those are, you know, rare animals. So, you know, so growing up, I, I used to play a lot of tennis. I was very active, but I was always overweight. And and when I was start when I was involved in starting Indigo, my weight just kept going up and it was some. And I looked at myself once in a picture and I was just like so uncomfortable and ashamed and, and things like that and body image issues or whatever it is. But, but I, I was not, an, I wouldn't say I was at all an underconfident person. You know, confidence has not been something that I've struggled with. But having said that, having said that, what changed was from that moment when I saw that picture, I was 86 kilos. Uh, and, and this is also about almost about the same time that I was taking on the Indigo CEO role, by the way, just coincidentally. Mm. And, and five and a half months later, I was down 18 kilos. Wow. And I ran a half marathon. I went from 86 kilos to 68 kilos, and I ran a half marathon in two hours, four minutes. Uh, but what it helped me do, and that is what, this was in 2009, February of 2009, but what, what it has helped me do for the next 12 years after that is, when you break through that wall, when you break, you know, climb that mountain in your head, you realize that there is a lot that you can do which you thought was not possible. The second thing is, the, my, my fitness journey has, has um, has not only given me this confidence of taking on challenges, but more importantly, also, especially, you know, I, I, I do a fair amount of weight training and then, you know, I used to run earlier, I play tennis. Uh, I do some amount of wall climbing, rock climbing with my son. I'm a certified scuba diver now and all kinds of other things like that. What it also helped me is to, to, to focus, you know, because when you're, especially when you're weight training and you're doing things like that, or you're like in a hanging off a cliff or something of that sort, or even for that matter, in a game of tennis and you're trying to score a point, you know, your eyes are only focused on that tennis ball. The rest of the world just has to disappear. And that then kind of helps you tr take that and translate that almost one-on-one, one-to-one into your, into your, you know, work life. And I think that's when these two things started merging. And, and I strongly encourage, I strongly encourage whether you are, whether you are struggling with weight or you're, or you're thin and you think you're fit, I strongly encourage you to, to experiment and play with this thing. And it'll open up aspects of your life, aspects of your personality that you, that you don't think, uh, you know, are possible. Um, and it's not all to do with vanity. It has actually very little to do with vanity at the end of the day. It is, it is a mind game. You're actually playing against yourself. You're competing against yourself. And I think, and, and I think that's been an extremely, extremely interesting experience for me. 
you're fascinating. Uh, so the first five and a half months where you lost uh, 18 kgs and ran a marathon, you also yeah. were working uh, intensely. Yes, I was marathon. also, I was also, yeah, I was also, you know, yeah, walking my first few steps as the chief executive of, of Ethico. Yeah. So um, you mentioned something really interesting that this mindset helps you deliver at multiple levels. It makes you break through the wall, break through the barriers and push and perform at a, at a, at a greater level. So as uh, let's start with how did you, how did the CEO opportunity of Indigo come to four? And it's a really difficult industry. In business school, we constantly are made to be wary of the airline industry for all the challenges it puts people through. So um, what were you thinking and uh, coming in, um, what did you really want to do? You transformed the industry in one of the hard, some of the hardest years. It must not have been uh, easy or simple to figure out. Yeah, look, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a very tough business. It is also a very crazy market. Um, and, uh, and, and I, yeah, and I came into this business. Uh, um, I, I came to run the airline in 2008 when uh, the world was melting down. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fuel had touched $146 a barrel economic recession, the global recession, and, and so on and so forth. Um, you picked the, your timing well. <laughs> yes, I, I clearly <laughs> seem to be a sucker for punishment. <laughs> so um, I, I, let me first answer the question how I came, came about to doing the role. Um, so my involvement with Indigo goes back to when it was at that, you know, proverbial cocktail napkin stage. Um, uh, and... Uh, when Rahul and Rakesh, for, Rahul started thinking about the airline. I started talking to him about it. We went and spoke to Rakesh about it. Rakesh took a couple of years to say yes to it. So my, my journey at Indigo starts from there and then the aircraft order and, and so on. But I never ran the airline. I was, I was on the board and, and I used to work closely with the two, uh, the CEO and the COO, who we had invited from the United States, um, Bruce and Steve. But in 2008, you know, as things were melting down, Indigo was in crisis. Um, we had not made money. We had very little money left on our balance sheet. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Bruce was going back. Steve was going back. Uh, the people culture was not something we could be proud of. There were very, very large competitors and fuel and recession and all of those. And in those days, uh, you know, Rahul uh, and Rakesh, I think, had a conversation and, and Rahul came up to me and said that, you know, that, yeah, uh, you should come and run the airline. <laughs> I was like, no, I mean, that's a really bad idea. I mean, you know, I, I, like, I mean, this is just, just, I mean, is this some kind of a joke or, and, uh, and, 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 and he said, no, I mean, seriously, both Rahul, Rakesh and I think that you should come and run the airline. I was like, no way. I mean, this is, I've never, I've never been to business school. I've never had a business role in my life. I, um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, this is the most volatile, you know, business of the group. There are, there are over a thousand employees who are, who are, who are employed here. And even at a personal level, right? I mean, I was, I was a lawyer. If I'm going to fail at this, nobody's going to hire me as a lawyer back. Nobody's going to hire me as a manager. We had two tiny infant kids. I mean, it was betting my whole life and my whole career. So this conversation went back and forth with Rahul uh, for for uh, uh, for a couple of months, uh, and uh, I used to take these long walks outside the Indigo office in the courtyard. Um, and uh, but finally, like you know, Rahul said, "Look, Althea, I mean, I'm I'm here. You are not going anywhere. Fine. If you if you if you don't like it, you can come back and you know." be a general counsel to, that you are. And, uh, and I said, okay, uh, fine, Rahul, I'll, I'll do it till March. So this was summer of 2008. He said, March when? And I said, March of 2009. He said, no, no, let do it for a year and a half. Hmm. And uh, then we'll see. And I said, yeah, in the meantime, let's hire a real CEO. And, and then, you know, then we'll do this. 
And I remember on the eve of when I was coming in, I sent a SMS in those days, SMS to, to Rahul saying, um, Rahul, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. And within seconds, Rahul replied back saying, uh, that's all I'm looking for at the end. And, uh, and I think that gave me the confidence to come in. And how I survived and how things turned around over the next nine or 10 months and we, we broke even nine months later, turned the airline around. We didn't have to look back, fortunately. That I think the credit goes to the leadership team of Indigo that I was surrounded by. And literally the thousand you know, other people who were working in the air. And I don't say this lightly. Um, firstly, why the leadership team? For two reasons. One, every one of my direct reports was older to me. Every one of my direct reports was far more, you know, um, far more experienced in that area of work and definitely in the airline business. Our head of uh, flight operations had become a pilot before I was born. Our head of engineering had passed out of IIT Delhi before I was born. Our head of in-flight had become a flight attendant when I was five years old, right? Hmm. Our, 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 our CFO had become a chief chartered accountant when I was in grade five or grade four, right? What amazing self-confidence and, and, and generosity of heart that they must have had to accept me as their leader. The second is that to be, to be, I was ever curious. So to be able to patiently explain and answer my questions and, and, and you know, sometimes take my guidance and work together. That's why you know, they, are, they, they, they played a huge role in what we were able to do. Why the other thousand people, right? And then the next 20,000 people. You know, of course, the airline business is such, it just doesn't matter who the chief executive is. And, and therefore, you know, it's these thousands of people who made me look good for, for 15 years of my life and make me look good even today. And I'm ever, ever deeply grateful for it. You know, when I look at an airplane and it's standing at the airport, here's what it reminds me of. Each time, here's a $100 million airplane full of revenue paying passengers, experienced pilots, courtiers, experienced flight attendants, maintenance has done its job, engines are spooled up, ATC is given clearance. But if that marshaller does not come with those two table tennis bat type of things and, and you know, waves the right signals, I, as the chief executive of the airline, or the president of the airline cannot move that airplane back. I cannot move that airplane out. So it's a deep reminder how in the airline business, especially, and many other businesses, everyone is an equal. We just have different roles to play. Yeah. If you're able to internalize that, uh, you realize that you know it's because of those tens of thousands of other people that, uh, that we become who we are and, 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 and I got the success and the attention and the reason that you're talking to me is, is then. You know, um, thank you for uh, you know, sharing this. This was really insightful to get a, get a flavor of this opportunity and how it came to you. Um, tell us about some of the uh, contrarian or slightly challenging decisions that you had to take uh, at Indigo. Um, and also tell us the thought process and the dilemma behind it. One thing that I, uh, that I observed when I spoke to people or speak to people is that the brand of Indigo and the experience of Indigo was uh, clearly, you know, a few notches above the uh, other players. And I'm sure that uh, this didn't just happen. Yes, yes. Um, I think, you know... Um... The contrarian view um, actually comes out of focus and focus on a few things that really work. And, and even in Akasa today, as we are building out a new airline, we're doing the same thing. That you say, Congratulations, okay, by the way. That's, thank you. That's new. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And, and, and you pick a few things and you really focus on that. And what's contrarian is 
you say no to everything else. And that's very, very hard. It's very hard because of two reasons. One, you know, people always constantly talk about innovation, right? And they constantly want you to try out the next new thing, right? So it takes a lot of discipline to be able to say no to something. A no to 10 new ideas. The second is that human beings, we are, our brain is wired as such is that we're constantly, you know, getting distracted by the next new thing. But, you know, we, we, our attention goes to whatever walked into the room. New. The shiniest new object. That's right. Yeah. So therefore, it takes a lot of discipline to say no to this, no to that. No to a, no to a separate check-in line. No to a, you know, you know a frequent flyer line. No to a frequent flyer po uh, points. No to, uh, uh, no to, you know, hot food. And no to, you know... Um, you know, fancy cars and, you know, all, all kinds of things like that, right? Um, and just stay disciplined on, on what, what really matters. Um, but one of the larger decisions was back in 2008-9 itself. Um, you know, our, 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 our um, market share went from about 8-9% to something like 14%. And we're still not making money. And then we decided that we are going to actually cut back and reduce market share, but focus on profitability. And, and market share dropped from 14 to 11%, but we started making money. Now, when your airline is shrinking and the newspapers are telling you every day that the airline is shrinking, and you're becoming smaller in terms of market share. And you're still chasing profitability, but that's not yet happened. It takes a lot of, you know, courage and discipline to be able to do that. And I think that was one, and th then there, there were many others, but, mm. but this was one where it, it, it's really out there, you know, in the, in the public domain. And everybody's saying, things about you and, and in the airline business, of course, everybody has an opinion. Um, and I think uh, the, the, that, that is one of, the, one, of the, one of the best examples that I can give you, which is, which yeah. is a hard, difficult decision to make. Yeah, it, uh, filtering the signal from noise, ignoring the media hype versus what you yeah. should do, yeah. saying no to uh, things even when they seem tempting. These are things that um, everyone struggles with day in, day out. I was wondering, are there did you have an outsider's advantage? Is there such a thing as an outsider uh, who has, I yeah? I, I, I think there is, there is a, there's, a, there's of course a penalty to it. You, you have to, you don't know anything about the business. Or Earn your the credibility. So of the business. Speak. You've got to learn every day. But the outsider's advantage is that you are able to question things or you attempt to attempt to understand things at a very basic one-on-one -on -one sort of practical logic sort of way you know why you know, why is this happening why do we do this you know why are we not doing that and and that doesn't mean you have to do it but at least it 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 it, it forces you to keep questioning it questioning it questioning it till you get a sort of satisfactory answer and i think that's the outside in uh, you know uh, uh, advantage that you that you have Ab absolutely but but, yeah. but you know I, I dare say also that you know because it 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 has to come with a fair measure of humility. I mean, you cannot just go in and say, no, no, this is the way it's, it's, I want to do this just because it's not been done before. It doesn't matter, that kind of a thing. So you've got to have that humility to, to deeply understand why something is happening, but at the same time, have the courage to try out something new that, that may, have, may not have been done before or, or thought of. Yeah. You know, I love your why questions. Once, um, I heard you ask, why should we scale? Or why does one want to scale? Yeah. And you've been a part of uh, industries where I think scale has been really important. Uh, and now you're doing something at one level, which is yeah. hyperscale. And at yeah. one level, you have Chorangi, which is, is one, 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 restaurant. Yeah. one restaurant, but perhaps the best uh, 
uh, you know, Calcutta and experience around the world. So tell me, why? what does scale mean to you? And on one hand, we look at Indigo, Oyo, Akasa, Fab India, hyperscale. And the other end, you have uh, Chorangi. I love it, but I want to understand the thought process. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, g- g- thank you. Um, look, um, you know, especially in today's world, um, where, you know, everybody is trying to show growth. Everybody is trying to scale up because that's what takes you to the next round of funding and so on and so forth. I think it's very easy to lose track of why you're, you're trying to scale. And I think the way I kind of think about it is that, I mean, does scaling up bring you efficiency, cost efficiency? Does scaling up bring you, you know, um, access to customers that you do not have otherwise? Does scaling up bring you, um, you know, uh, some ability to bring in, you know, better technology? Does scaling up uh, bring you, you know, the ability to take your product in the same consistent manner to, you know, millions of people or thousands of people? There has to be a reason for scaling up other than saying, I'm just bigger. Other than just saying, I now have access to more money. There has to be some purpose to that scaling up. So in the case of the airline business or case of a hotels business like Oyo, scaling up is important because especially the airline business, the scale gives you the cost efficiency dramatically. Yeah. In the case of Oyo, it is that there are literally millions, if not hundreds of thousands of, of you know, unorganized guest houses and experiences around the world, which can then be brought into some kind of a you know, consistent franchise. So the scale helps you to create that consistent experience. The scale, scale helps you bring about efficiency. In the case of Chorangi, um, it is a very curated product where I think at least certainly at this stage, we may scale years from now, but at this stage, each customer who walks in is extremely important. And that the taste of that food, that experience, should be something that you know people should you know walk away from. I I really I, and and thank you for those compliments. Um, I I'm, I'm going to share them with my team at Chorangi and my colleagues at Chorangi and especially Anjan, who's my partner there. It is so great to hear that someone who did not know me went there and and just enjoyed that experience, every dish or or everything, the decor, whatever it is. As much as somebody who said, you know what, I just blindly fly this airline because you know I just know what I'm going to what I'm going to get. So, if if you do not have, if someone does not have a clear, 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 clear sort of uh, you know answer to why scaling up is important, and by scaling up, why we will not start fraying at the edges, mm. that's please don't go ahead and. Do it. Because today, if I take Chorangi, if, we, if Anjan and I take Chorangi and build five of them around the world, our experience is going to fray because this is just too new. We, we will not have the systems. You know, we will not have to. Have, we, will, we will not be able to do a the, the same type of experience in San Francisco and Dubai and New York and, and and as in London. Someday we might be able to, but certainly not today. And and therefore, and I don't think we have a compelling answer to why why we should scale up, other than saying. We've got, you know, restaurants around the world and, you know, you get known and you get written about. That's not a good enough reason. Yeah. Every aspect of uh, uh, the Chorangi experience was personalized. I had gone with, uh, like, you know, uh, a person who is not Indian, my, uh, you know, like, you know, um, yeah. and uh, the, per- like, you know, like she had, uh, a- she's compelled to go to Calcutta now because of an experience like that in London. Um, uh, and she obviously I mean she will see this masterclass but she doesn't uh, know your past leadership experiences but I think she would still wonder and many people would wonder why did the, he set up Chorangi is it the expression of a curiosity a passion project um, what was the drawing board conversation of Chorangi like 
So I have to give credit to Anjan, who is, uh, you know, Anjan Chatterjee, who runs speciality restaurants, it's a large listed company uh, based on in F&B and restaurants. Anjan and I have been friends for a very long time. So if anything, 99% of the credit of Chorangi should go to Anjan and the balance 1% I'm writing is coattails. Um, I think it was, it was, we were having a meal some years ago at one of his restaurants. And as he puts it, he had, there's a lot of wines down, um, although I don't drink. So, and, and at that time, this idea of taking uh, the, the cuisine, taking it overseas, doing a restaurant overseas, and especially London, because, you know, it's just such a food capital of the world. I mean, you can't, you can barely ever have a bad meal in London, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and the, the dinner ended and Anjan really tells me that he thought that, and you know, I was just, I was just generally chatting, but two or three days later, I think I started messaging him and started pushing him that, you know, we've got to bring this idea to reality. Um, and, and, uh, and, that dream has become a reality now. But if you have to ask me why I did it, I mean, Anjan did it because, you know, it's, this is his restaurant. He's in the restaurant business. He's like the doyen of the restaurant business in India. Why I did it is that, first of all, I think there is definitely an opportunity, right? There's a huge gap in the market. There is no real Calcutta Bengali food restaurant in London, which is surprising, but it's true. The second is, Indian food is associated with primarily with North Indian food and then South Indian food. Yeah. Right? And that too, food from Punjab and Tamil Nadu, right? So there is, there is, we, we are such a large, diverse country, you know, there is, there is Parsi food, there is Bengali food, there is you know, Maharashtrian food, there's Gujarati food. I mean, there is just so, so many different wonderful cuisines out, out of India. The food out of the Northeast and in, in part of India, Rajasthan. So there is, there are these gaps in the market. This, the third is that, you know, it's a Bengali cuisine is a very complex cuisine. It's, a, it's not a simple food to make. And most people I think have shied away from it because it is so complex. And that kind of brought about the challenge. Then there were some other fun aspects to it in the sense that, you know, I hope many of our listeners will go to Charangi someday or at least look up the Instagram handle or you know, whatever it is. You would have seen Utkarsh when you went there. It doesn't look like a typical Indian restaurant. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. And, and that was the other thing we wanted. We were like, you know, we wanted to be an international experience with great food out of Calcutta. But it doesn't have to have red tablecloth with, you know, two natrajas and a bell and like, you know, dark and, you know, <laughs> all that. Yeah. It can be a really refreshing experience, you know, which is bright and vibrant and like, you know, and at the same time, the, the food walls, the food. floors, exactly. the windows, exactly. every aspect of it. Would, it exactly. was, I was yeah. a very proud Indian, you know, showing yeah, it around you, to somebody who's Indian. not Indian. Yeah. So, so I think for me, the reason comes down to, okay, we took something which was a hard thing to do. And hopefully we've got, got off to a good start. Uh, and, yeah. you know, you know I, I like detail-oriented things. So, so this has been fun. Yeah. No, we'll most certainly attach the... Instagram handle and other social media handles and we'll host a bunch of uh, meetups there we have like yes, offline yes. chapters all around the world we'll, we'll uh, today delighted. it's in London uh, Chaurangi but I'm pretty sure there'll be lots of those yes. but I'm I know that you will uh, be thinking of scale and design yes. all along yes, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Aditya are you somebody who enjoys multitasking do you yes, enjoy doing two different so. things at the same time very much so very much so today I I I'm starting a new airline. I'm doing Chorangi. I work a lot with the self-employed uh, women's association, Seva, which is the largest women's trade union in India. I am the chairperson of all the social enterprises there. I do work with unicorns like Lenscard. I, I, um, there are a bunch of different things. I, I'm on the board of Fab India and OYO. There are a bunch of different things that I do. And I've... I've now come to the stage where I can very confidently say that I like it. I think for a, for a few years, I shied away from it. And I said, you know what, you know, what will people say? You need to be focused on a few things and so on and so forth. But I've realized that I've, and I've got comfortable with the fact that I'm a multidimensional personality. I like those different dimensions of mine. I like my fitness along with my, you know, social impact work as much as I like starting an airline or, or working at a restaurant. 
Um, and but it requires planning. Hmm. It requires careful thought. Um, uh, and somebody recently asked me <laughs> a very interesting question. She asked me, "What's your relationship with time?" <laughs> hmm. was, was, <laughs> See, that is a great really question. Cool, cool, yeah. cool question. <laughs> so. Um, so time and I have a I have a very interesting relationship, I guess. But uh, but I think I I, I do enjoy doing uh, multiple things. I otherwise I get I get very bored. I get I get very impatient. Uh, uh, at the same time, I'm also acutely aware that I hope I don't do a hash job of five different things. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I think the key it's, is that uh, taking energy from one dimension absolutely, of life absolutely, absolutely. to the other taking energy yeah. taking experiences sharing them learnings from various aspects well i think that that's important right um so are you able to uh, what is your relationship with time uh, how are you able to juggle your day week month year etc so i do get uh, in uh, i think i think jeff bezos calls it over scheduled i do get over scheduled at, at times uh, but where I uh, come ahead and where I, when I do it well, when I, why I do it well is that making sure that I'm able to compartmentalize my thinking. The, and the second is that, do I have trusted colleagues and team members that I can rely upon in, in, in various, various uh, you know, aspects of, of those things? So, and, and even in the places that I'm involved in today, each one of those places has have excellent partners who I'm so proud to be and privileged to be partnering with. And I also have, uh, you know, really committed, passionate colleagues who keep me within the straight and narrow, keep me focused and, and play a big role in, in, in what I'm doing. So fascinating. Um, just like last bit before we open it up for the final few minutes of questions. I'm very curious uh, to know what uh, a conversation at your household looks like today and what it looked like when you're growing up. I know your brother for many years, but you for less time. So I'm very fascinated by how both of you built your respective tribes and how did you learn from your respective mentors uh, and from each other, perhaps. Yeah, look, uh, my brother and I are uh, are almost opposite personalities. I'm the lazy procrastinating type and he's the highly disciplined, you know, uh, you know, focused kind of a guy. It, yeah, I mean, growing up was irritating. Like, you know, we would come back from a dinner or an outing from somewhere. And, uh, and I remember this, this story, like, you know, he must've been, I don't know, he must've been five or six years old. So I must've been eight or nine. And we, it was summer vacation. And we came, my, our parents had taken us out for a movie and dinner, and then we came back. And it was, I, I keep distinctly remember, it was like some 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, I'm half asleep, I'm, I'm dying to go to bed, right? And I suddenly see, he, we used to have a, right, he used to have a, you know, study desk next to our bed. And this five-year-old has started doing some writing on some copy with a, with a pencil. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, and, and, and like my parents are also like, what are you doing? He's like, no, ma'am said you have to do one page of handwriting every day. And I'm like, oh God, you, you know, just go to sleep because of you, I will now be in trouble because, you know. <laughs> so, but he, he is that kind of a guy. He's very conscientious. But, but look, I've been super proud of him. He's very super inspiring, even though he's younger to me. Um, but the conversations at home, frankly, are not about professional successes at all. Our, our parents, uh, whether it was uh, both my mother and father, uh, were always that, you know, you have to, you have to work hard, uh, study, play, but more than anything else, you have to be a good human being. You have to be a good human being. This was something that was kind of drilled into us so we were we were scolded for my mother for not studying or being lazy or whatever it is, and the most of the scolding came to me, not to him. But having said that, um, the, it was all about 
are you helping out at home are you you know if there are guests coming are you serving water and are you you know helping with setting up the dinner table are, are you offering water to somebody who knocked at the door are you being a good person uh, you know are you being respectful to elders it was really simple things like that which were extremely powerful um uh, and uh, and i think even today uh you know that's that's been the that's been the tone uh, of course i'm extremely proud of what his achievements are his wife megna is another she's a co-founder she's a co-founder of slurp farm uh, uh which is another you know fm organic foods fmcg business uh which is really doing well we're so proud of her my wife manvi who is uh, a phenomenal mother to the to the children and she used to be a professional earlier so it's it's a uh, um yeah it's none of it is to do with professional success uh, actually uh, awesome yeah last question what uh, what is it the same thing with your kids what do you tell them and what advice um a most common advice do you have for young professionals or startup folks who meet you um yeah so uh, our, our kids of course have a mind by of themselves uh they are they are good kids they're not they're not they uh, they're indisciplined in the way that okay their bed will not be made or something of that sort but not not no bad not nothing nothing really bad or nothing you know they they're good very conscientious kids uh, of course the, and so uh, so is my brother's daughter i think the definitely the the credit goes to their mother and you know and so on and so forth um but i think uh i think in terms of uh what i tell them is is the same thing you know what what i mm. think i have learned from my parents um not that they're listening to me too much <laughs> but but what i tell my other younger colleagues is primarily to to again just do two things put your heart and soul into whatever is being is being you know the opportunity that you have and the second more important thing is be young and enthusiastic don't be young and impatient you know young and, and enthusiastic yeah yeah and because i think you know things will come it will come over a period of time uh, and even if they don't come the way you expect them to be it, it is it is going to be a learning process it's going to be a, a learning experience i think that's that's what kind of you know is what i always always uh, you know say and something that i keep saying is just chase your dreams you know just chase your dreams you know the personal dreams not the professional dreams you chase your dreams you know um sending your parents on a holiday sending your children to the right school you know uh making sure your siblings get the right education whatever is your deeply personal dream you know playing the guitar acting in a movie uh you know once you start chasing those personal dreams you realize that your professional successes only help you there they only help you get closer to that to that personal dream that's what yeah I, i love that i really love that point the purchase your personal dream um with eyes and heart uh, fully open aditya this was a, such a delight uh, thank you so very much for uh, spending time with us we do have a couple of minutes left so i just want to pause and check if there are any live questions that uh, anybody wants to pose um utkarsh there's one in the chat that swagata had asked which is okay yeah um, sure um how did you manage to get your point across in case of a, di- a disagreement i think she was um, referring to when you were um talking about working with people much more senior than you yeah, were yeah. ago i i think i think it's a combination of first of all being respectful for the years of experience that they bring in but also being able to present your argument or present your point of view with logic uh and uh, and 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 i've been again fortunate that that um, yes there are many times we've had disagreements uh but i have gone along with them when i've said that okay fine let's give it a shot if we if we fail we fail but we'll learn from it and they have gone along with me when i've been able to kind of present a logic and said you know let's give this a try and, and let's see um i've been fortunate that none of them came around and said no this is the only way to be done um uh, unless they logically explained to me that they are this is why it's done it this way and i said yeah okay i didn't think of it that way kind of thing so um so i think it's 
it's it's a question it's it's having the having the arrogance to question the past but also the respect to to you know to to learn from the past like choran reinventing it right <laughs> taking the <me> best <laughs> well thank you so much aditya i know you're supremely busy and uh, things at home also um yeah. you know, i wish to wish everyone well really appreciate your time and thanks to everyone who joined we're going to make it live and attach the link of uh, chorangi so that lots and lots of people check it out thank you so much it's been a uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and i hope that uh, you know you, you guys are able to continue to do the great work that you that you're doing and uh, because it's going to help just so many people so uh, i i i wish you just all the best thank you We treasure your support and leadership. Thank you, Aditya. Thank you, everyone. See you soon.